Washington Journal continues. Our first guest of the morning is Aidan Bazzetti of the 1776 Project PAC. He is their Coalitions and Candidate Recruitment Director. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on. About the PAC, what is it? So the 1776 Project PAC is a super PAC that gets involved in local school board elections. We've been around since 2021. We have won over 200 school board races all across the country. I, I believe that we've been involved in at least 25 of, of the 50 states so far. But our, our main goal is to get more conservative but also responsive school board members onto these boards so we can actually start reversing all of the pandemic learning loss that's taken place over the last few years. Such as what? Such as lowered math and, and reading comprehension. 66% of students in America cannot read at grade level. And we've had the biggest drop in math, uh, math comprehension since the 1990s, according to the National Association of Educational Progress. Uh, it, adding on to the fact that we've had more violent schools, uh, our, our students are not recovering even with the billions and billions of dollars that the federal government has appropriated to these local school districts, we're not bouncing back from all of the lockdowns and the mask mandates, and we've got to figure out why, and we need to reverse that. Do you have thoughts on why it's not happening? Well, I think there's, there's a few things. Number one, we aren't teaching students how to read correctly. That's probably one of the core issues here, but I think we're forgetting the fact that putting these, these really young kids in a virtual environment or, or forcing them to wear masks or, or learning online is not the best way to learn in general. And the, the most important years of, of learning, of academic development happen, the younger kids are. So that, that's the biggest roadblock we have. But adding on to just years and years of being behind, if you're behind when you're in third grade, chances are you're going to be behind in eighth grade, you're going to be behind when you're in a high school, and you're going to be behind when you're in college. You say you come from a conservative uh, approach, putting people of that like on school boards. Why mm -hmm. do you think that's necessary? Why is it a conservative school board going to change things or at least change those things you talked about? Because we believe that conservative school board members are the most responsive to the different aspects of the community because they take in into consideration what parents feel, they take into consideration what students feel, and they do care about teachers even though many other people say otherwise because 70% of our teachers feel like they're overworked. And a lot of these more liberal policies add more burdens on the teachers in the first place. We want to take a lot of these restrictions off and actually have school boards do the job they're supposed to do, which is manage the schools in the first place. A lot of the school boards now rely on the superintendent and the administrators to make all the decisions without taking any responsibility for themselves as a local elected body. We want to reverse that trend and so do the people we help elect. Is it just strictly education approaches that you're concerning yourself with or are there social issues such as certain books you can read or certain things you can teach in classrooms? Is that part of what you're proposing when you put these members on boards? I mean, we, we are focused on the educational issues here. I, I think you know, th th there's a lot of talk about the culture war and there's a lot of talk about, you know, books and, and what does and does not belong in schools. But I even in a hypothetical situation, if we can snap our fingers and take all of these culture wars out of the schools, the, the locker rooms are no longer an issue, books are no longer an issue, what are we left with? We're left with awful schools. We're left with students that are functionally illiterate from the time they enter third grade until they graduate and beyond. That is the real problem here. That's what we're focused on. And if, if an individual community feels like that they need to tackle quote unquote social issues, then that is up to them. That's the whole reason why we have these local governing bodies. But we are focused on people who actually want to turn our public education system around, not just focus on privatizing it and leaving 80% of our students in the U.S. behind. One more question on that. If you endorse a candidate or support a candidate, are they required to then focus on certain books you can read or certain things you could teach in class? Is that a requirement to get money from your PAC? No, we do not have candidates sign a pledge. We do not give them specific asks. The only thing that we want to know when we talk to them is we want to know if they're committed to reversing pandemic laws. We want to know if they're committed to transparency in their governing body. And if they fulfill those requirements and we know that they're going to do a good job, we support them, no strings attached. And before we uh, invite callers and callers, if you want to call in and ask our guest questions, it's Democrats 202-748-8000, Republicans 202-748-8001, Independents 202-748-8002. You can text us at 202-748-8003. Uh, how are you funded? 
we are funded primarily from grassroots donors. We have tens of thousands of donors and our average donation is less than $20. This is a grassroots movement for our organization. We may have a nationwide focus, but parents all across the country are giving us their pocket change because they know something is wrong and they want to turn it back around. Uh, how do, when did this idea of a need for this kind of approach start? How did, what was the genesis of that? The genesis of the 1776 Project Pack was our founder, Ryan Gradusky, found out that his, uh, his nephew had been assigned the book Race Cars in school. There's a book about police brutality, and uh, he, he realized that the school system was not being responsive to the needs of his parents. The, all the, the police officers in the community were outraged, and they were outraged, but nothing happened. And he did some research, and he found out that there is no conservative group that is focused on school boards. And this was really before it, it took off. And we ended up launching it in the spring of 2021, and we won 80% of our races in those elections, and it just took off from there. But we are the only national group that is focused on school board elections from a conservative perspective. It was last year that the American Federation of Teachers after elections for school boards and things came out. They put out this saying, when public education was on the ballot, public education won. An AFT analysis of approximately 250 races where the far right backed anti-public education candidates found AFT supported candidates won over 80% of the time. Anti-public education candidates publicly supported by Moms for Liberty and the 1776 Project Pact lost 75% of the time. We actually won 60% of our races. Uh, so wh whatever statistics, statistics they were looking at is not true. And in fact, we've had candidates go head to head with school board, uh, with teachers unions back candidates where they were running television ads and we were doing traditional outreach and they won with an overwhelming majority. So they, they are afraid of the parental rights movement in this country. They know that we have long-term momentum and we're gonna keep fighting them on every single turn. What do you think? They defined you as anti-public education. We are not anti-public education. Our entire focus is reversing the decline of our public education system. We have absolutely no stake on, on some of the other issues in the education space. We are focused only on public education and being there for students. Can I ask you though then, you just said your founder started this because it was a book. Yes. And you said you were necessarily not going that right. It was strictly education mm -hmm. that was concerning. Is there mm -hmm. a disconnect there? No, I, I don't think there's a disconnect because the, the, this book issue was during the peak COVID era. Mm -hmm. That has largely died down. Parents have kind of settled on what they and what they don't want their communities to do. That's not an issue that we weigh in on. There are candidates that are concerned with what is available in schools and in the curriculum, and it's the school board's job to set the curriculum. So yes, this, this is a component of education as a space, but we, again, we are focused on public education. And again, being focused on, uh, on, on racial uh, systemic injustices is not the right path in our public education system. So where those intersect, then yes, we, we do talk about that, but broadly, no, we are, we are focused only on reversing our public education system's decline. If uh, all of those things that took place under COVID as far as how students were learning and how well they were learning, how long do you think then is going to trend to a point where they're learning uh, before COVID, uh, learning in the way before COVID? I think it's gonna be a fairly long time. Uh, even, even with student behavior, absenteeism rates, missing 18 days or more school a year, which is uh, roughly equivalent to a month of school, mm -hmm. is up 40%. It doesn't matter if your school district is rural, suburban, or urban. Students are missing more of school now than ever before. And the AEI is saying that it might not even return to pre-pandemic levels until 2030. So we have a lot of work that we need to catch up on. It's gonna be a very, very long time unless we put in the right solutions to fix to fix the problems in our public education Is system. a solution more time in the classroom? Is a solution more interaction directly with the teacher? What's the best solution? Or at least what are best practices well, in your mind? Well, so Mississippi did something very interesting a few years ago. In the mid 2010s, they passed a bill that among other things, prevented third graders from advancing to fourth grade if they did not score on a certain level in reading proficiency. Mm -hmm. And just five years, they went from 49th to 29th in the country in their reading proficiency levels. This is not the only solution. Uh, there are plenty of other things that we can do, but just preventing students from advancing grade levels when they don't understand the material before them is one of the key aspects of reviving our system right now. Aidan Bazzetti joining us for this discussion of the 1776 Project Pack. And again, if you wanna give them a call and ask questions, you can do so on the phone lines. Let's start with Kim. 
Kim is in Illinois. Democrats line for our guest. Kim, good morning. You're first up. Go ahead. Good morning. I was listening to him, and I read up on his project. He's with his mom for liberty, banning books. If you're going to tell the truth for it to children, it's from the whole truth and nothing but the truth of America history, not part. The school, my, I have a grandson that's in third grade, and they just labeled him the best reader after the pandemic. So he was under the pandemic. Wearing a mask is protecting others, if he just don't realize. And he needs to stop lying. Thank you. Kim in Illinois. Well, I, I will say that uh, in regards to the reading, uh, most of our teachers, 70% of our teachers, use an outdated instructional method. So they, they use something called three queuing, which is very heavily reliant on guessing or figuring out which word works in the context of the sentence. Uh, our candidates support something called the, the science of reading, which is more focused on phonics. It is more fo uh, focused on uh, decoding sentences so they actually understand how to put words together. Uh, that's one of the, the main solutions that, that we want to propose. Is it just reading or is it the other, does it extend to math or other skills that tip school students typically learn in school? Uh, the, the science of reading is, is mostly focused on reading. There, there are some arguments that you can apply it on the math side, but I mean. Well, what I meant, I'm sorry about it, what your organization's concerned, is it just no. reading or is it other subjects as well, I should say? No, we're, we're focused on other subjects. I mean, like I said, we've had the biggest drop in math comprehension since 1990. Our student disciplinary standards are, are out of control. In fact, the number one issue that we have found with parents, teachers, and students is safe schools. And, and one of the biggest uh, problems that we have found when I interview candidates is that their schools are not enforcing disciplinary standards and uh, it's making everybody in the classroom uncomfortable and not able to learn. That includes the teacher in the first place. Why do you think that's existing? Why do you think that discipline is a problem? Well, it, it largely has to do uh, with something called restorative justice. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, it is promoted by a, a large number of Democratic governors and education professionals. Uh, but they, they want to focus on growth uh, for students. They, they want to focus on growth instead of punishing the students because they believe that punishing them is bad. But students, kids are smart. They know when they can get away with things and they will push it to the limit. And we have found an increasing number of violence in schools uh, and a lot of those school districts also are not transparent enough and try to cover it up. When you're fielding candidates for specific school board races, what do you put them through as far as determining uh, whether you'll support them or not? So my job as the head of coalitions is to interview every single candidate. So in 2023, we got involved in just over 200 school board races. I probably interviewed 500 or 600 candidates for the school board. So we do an interview process. We talk with other groups on the ground to make sure that we are working in tandem because we believe that we should be team players and, and not work against uh, the candidates of other groups. And we put them through this, this hour long or more interview to make sure we understand what they stand for uh, before we support them. Again, Aiden Mazzetti is our guest. 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans and Independents, 202 some for eight, eight thousand two. Um, does the organization have an election year strategy? Are you involved in that in any way? So we will be getting getting involved in one purple state and one blue state in the upcoming November election. The reason why we're doing that is because we believe number one that we can make an impact in these local races, and, and number two, we do also have a belief that the result of our involvement might trickle up the ballot. Uh, instead of the other way around. So this is a way that we can get more conservatives who are engaged on the education issue out to vote in general. What are the states, if I may ask? Well, uh, if I have to reveal it here, then we, we will be getting involved in, uh, in Arizona and in Maryland. What made the decision for, for the both of those states? What was the determining factor? In, in, in large parts, we, we get involved on the, the number of candidates, so the biggest widespread impact, impact we can have on a specific state. If you look at our endorsements, they usually come up in clusters. And we do that because we believe that uh, we can work with our partners to have a, a wide geographic impact in that state. And the more people we have supporting each other with the same or similar agendas in these school districts, 
the better because they can go then to the legislature, they can advocate for specific changes that we need. And audience, by the way, if you're a parent with a child in school and you're an educator, you can call us too at 202-748-8003. That's where Michael is, an educator. He's from Florida. Michael, good. you're on with our guest. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I taught I taught seventh grade science class. And all of my kids got an A because I expected it of them, uh, very similar to what your guest uh, mentioned with Mississippi. Now, I do want to point out something, though. I'd be very curious to know what he thinks of uh, Mr. DeSantis having gone and bullied uh, all of the textbook publishers into removing what Mr. DeSantis calls woke. Now, woke is really just welcoming, open, and kind to everyone, honestly. But the fact that he's removed and, and had those textbooks altered means that I'm basically in agreement with your guest that we do need to remove all of our textbooks. They need to be decolonialized. Uh, we need to see to it that they're teaching accurate history. You know, just like we don't want statues that are giving a misrepresentation of what real history is, we don't want textbooks doing that. Our uh, science textbooks, for example, um, teach evolution as being just competition. It's not. It's about operation. Um, if I say the word evolution to a typical person off the street, uh, the, the parts of their brain that activate when I say the word competition and evolution, they're, they're going to be the same parts that are going to light up. We have all been kind of brainwashed by uh, we need to decolonialize our education. He's right about the kids failing. <laughs> That's true. And what our, we need to, to do what our Ivy League ski schools do in our uh, regular grade schools. They make sure that, that all the kids uh, that are able to graduate uh, come into their Ivy League schools uh, do get 60% plus and and uh, you're okay guest. Carla you, you, you put a lot out there for the guests so I'm gonna uh, pause you there thank you for the call we'll let our guests respond yeah I'll, I'll say a few things uh, number one it is up to Florida to decide what kind of materials they want uh, in in their classrooms but I, I will say that the the concept of decolonialization is uh, in fact critical theory it is uh, it is a pedagogy that is meant to influence students a certain way and I think DeSantis is right in taking that out of the schools and and I do want to hit on that point about Ivy League schools um, Ivy League schools are in fact not what they used to be unfortunately and I think it's pretty clear that the standards uh, of those students are also not great we've had rampant grade inflation in colleges uh, and, and also high schools that want to get their students into college in the first place and um, I, I, I have to say that I while I understand the uh, the concept of, of decolonialization, I think that is uh, right. I think it is right for Governor DeSantis to take that out because we sh should not, in fact, have those in schools. It is a complete distraction from the basics of education. Well, then compare Governor DeSantis's approach to the idea, just generally, of teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, America's history with slavery. Should that mm. be taught? Yeah, I, I mean, I think slavery is part of America's history, but that, that's not what decolonialization is. That's, that's not what these people are advocating for. They are saying that slavery is a sin that America cannot completely wipe away and that it is the fault of the current uh, white population of the United States and that we constantly have to make up for it in some way, uh, give reparations in some way, or feel bad for being part of the United States of America or being descended from you know, our founding fathers. Uh, that, that is not the way that we should be teaching our history. We can, teach, we can talk about slavery. We can talk about its negative effects. We can talk about how awful it was. But that's not what they're advocating for. They are advocating for a racial hatred of some kind. And it, we, we see this with Governor Walz's uh, term in the Minnesota governor, uh, in the Minnesota uh, Department of Education because they want to teach uh, anti-racism trainings to teachers. Their government website links to an article that talks about why white students need social justice education. This is not about teaching slavery. It is about teaching white people uh, that they should feel bad for their entire history. Governor Walls had some things to say about education at that DNC speech that he made a couple weeks ago. I want to play a little bit about it sure. and get your response. And we made sure that every kid in our state gets breakfast and lunch every day. So while other states were banning books from their schools, we were banishing hunger from ours. 
That's Governor Walls. Your reaction? Well, what I can say is if they were banishing hunger, they definitely weren't teaching their students because every single year, Minnesota's scores, their proficiency scores, have gotten lower and lower. And keep in mind that their state defines proficient as scoring 50% or more. That means almost half of their students or more are not even scoring 50% on their state standardized tests. Giving, giving students food uh, is, is fine, but school is not just a social program. It is supposed to be a place for learning, and they are obviously not accomplishing that. Republicans, are on the, particularly in the Trump administration, have criticized Governor Walls because of his approach during COVID, uh, particularly what he did for schools there. How would you define that approach, and what's the end result education-wise? I mean, if it's the, the exact same as a lot of other states, we saw a bunch of lockdowns. We saw a bunch of mask mandates. The parents were, were kept out of school, and so were their teachers. I, he, I don't think he did anything functionally different from what a lot of other states did, and the result is the same a bunch of learning loss from their students. Tony is next. Tony in uh, Delaware. Hello, you're on with our guest, Republican Line. Hey, good morning. So I'm so happy to have you take my call, Pedro. You're my favorite host except for Jan McArdle. You know, it's unfortunate um, for me to uh, have to call in today. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but, you know, um, I'm, I made myself familiar with this young man's organization this morning. Um, before I called in, just wanted to educate myself. Um, and uh, I looked at his other organization, the Bull Moose Project. And, um, you know, I'm a little confused about what he's talking about because I'm from Louisiana, west of the Mississippi River, okay? So I am a white man, all right? I grew up with black folks, dirt poor. All right? I don't think that this young man understands history. To begin with when it comes to white people in this country all right he is misrepresenting fundamentally one of the struggles for the soul of our republic and the things that make us americans school should be a place where children are inspired where they are all equally afforded for do you understand food is fine but are you kidding me listen i would like to know what exactly this young man expects people to learn at school, okay, about slavery and about these issues, because I suspect that uh, he does not have a proper view. Okay, of okay, that's Tony there. Uh, you elaborate a little bit, but you can go ahead and elaborate more if you yeah, wish. Yeah, no, I, I will say what, well, what I expect students to learn at school is I, I expect them to learn how to read. I expect them to learn how to do math. I expect them to behave well in the classroom and listen to their teachers. Uh, as far as slavery goes, I've, I've already talked about it. There's obviously nothing wrong with talking about slavery in our classrooms. Uh, but again, we face the fundamental question, our kids do not know how to read. They do not know how to do math. They are performing worse on every metric every single year. So I think the focus on slavery, I think the focus on this critical theory is misplaced. There is no problem with talking about slavery. There is a problem with talking about how all white people in America should feel bad because we had slavery several hundred years ago and that it's a constant problem, which is not quite true. You want children to be inspired in school? So do I. I don't want students to be taught to hate each other because of the color of their skin, because of something that happened before even our grandparents were born. Uh, from Jim. Jim joins us from Illinois, Democrats line. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm from a, a blue state, I guess. But as far as what I noticed on education is we had a relative that lived in Illinois and moved to Tennessee. And their child was in third grade and got promoted going to Tennessee to fourth grade. And they said, oh, that's because they have such a good education. No. It's because the child is more advanced in education in that state, so they had to bring them up a grade so they can keep up with their education. What I believe is instead of bringing it to the state level, they should bring it to the federal level. Everybody gets the same education. You unionize the teachers, all the states, and they get all the exact same education from each state. At the end of the year, you take a test. You don't pass, you redo the grade again. What's your opinion on that? 
Well, I, I will say that uh, the, the federal role in education is a little bit difficult uh, because the, uh, the power of education is one of the specific uh, enumerated things in the Constitution that is delegated to the state government. Uh, I don't believe that we will ever have a national curriculum. I, I do think that whatever the federal government's role in the education system is, it will probably be focused on using the, the power of the purse and, and block grants uh, to achieve certain outcomes. We, we, we've seen it a, a little bit uh, before. A, a lot of the current Department of Education contracts are focused on giving money to school districts for uh, consultants to try out new new uh, instructional methods and things like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a it's a little bit difficult to to say that the federal government can take over our education system uh, because the Constitution does not. Really former President that. Trump, I'm sorry, uh, former President Trump had a recent interview with Elon Musk, and one of the things he touted was uh, eliminating the Department of Education. Should it go that far? I, I think that's a that's a pretty complicated thing because it has been on, in the Republican platform for however many decades now. Um, if they manage to accomplish it. Uh, it, then any any role in federal government, though we'll probably still give block grants. It may just be moved to another department or or minimized. Um, I don't I don't quite know uh, what the impact of that would be. But most of our education process is still carried out on the the state and the local level. So I'm not quite sure how how much would actually change unless they started cutting a bunch of grants. He's, he insinuated some states will do well. If that were the case, some states maybe not. Some states are more reliant on federal funding than others. Uh, the, the, the COVID relief funds to school districts also really helped, but a lot of the school districts mismanaged it in the first place, which is why we don't really see a big learning bump uh, after or, or even during the pandemic in the first place. We have set aside a line for parents. This is Ernie. He's in Florida. Hi there. Go ahead. Good morning. I want to know if they're banning books. Why not ban the Bible? There's all kinds of uh, stories about sexism, racism, slavery, and everything else. Are they going to ban the Bible? That's what I would like to know. Uh, well, uh, first off, nobody is banning books. Uh, <laughs> There, there is a pretty acceptable standard of, of what is and is not allowed in school libraries and public libraries. Uh, it's, it's one reason, for example, uh, why we don't have Hustler in school libraries, because everybody agrees that that kind of material would be inappropriate uh, to have at, at the tip of our students' fingers. And, and a lot of the books that are removed or challenged for whatever reason do contain very graphic uh, scenes, and especially if they are graphic novels. And I, I think it's right that People in the community should go and debate and talk to school board members about what they can and, and should not do. Uh, as far as the Bible goes, I, I, I don't know how often the, the Bible is in the school library in the first place. Uh, and if it is, then that, that's certainly up to the community to decide, although I imagine there would be a, a lot of debate about that as well. Jeff is next. Jeff in Michigan, Republican line. Really, I have a question for you, the monitor. I mean, are there any books that are inappropriate to the left for children? As it is, you present that if child porn is written on paper, it should receive almost sacred status. And then this is great, you know, the talk about the Bible, you know, how the teachers unions want to get that back into school. They, they, they just absolutely reject the, just the uh, Ten Commandments alone. And then one last thing. Well, caller, you know, you, you're on with the guest, so if you want to address a question to the guest, go ahead. No, I'm, a, I'm addressing the question to you. You're drilling down on this gentleman's funding. When you have Soros that groups in, I don't see you guys doing that on C-SPAN. Okay, you're, well, you're... I'll stop you there. Funding is a regular question for us, so uh, we'll move on If you uh, to Michael. Michael is uh, in Massachusetts, independent line. Hello, you're next. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, you're on. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you for uh, C-SPAN very much. Yeah, I wanted to um, address uh, some things that have been said. <clears throat> First, uh, the uh, the speaker you have uh, talks about uh, violence in the schools, and I like to point out that uh, when I was in the fifth grade in 1955. Uh, I saw a student stab uh, another student uh, when 
my daughter was in the fifth grade in 1998, I want to say. Uh, someone grabbed her book bag and her hit her over the head uh, with it uh, because she was considered to be too smart. Uh, I'm presently in an educational role uh, in a community uh, which is largely Puerto Rican. And the great complaint of many Puerto Rican uh, family members is <clears throat> that a kind of social violence is being done to Puerto Rican students by not having anything to read or to see uh, in visual literacy. So caller, for, for, all, for all that said, what would you like our guests to address? I don't, so you, uh, you are saying that uh, violence uh, seems to be uh, a critical issue in uh, the classroom life today. And what I'm saying to you is that, uh, yes, it's a big issue, but it has always been a big issue. And that when students don't have any way to uh, uh, identify with the educational world, with the educational material. Uh, so the minimization of the importance of the uh, Civil War. Uh, okay, got your point, thank you. I, I will say that uh, it is true that students who can't understand the material are probably more likely to act out or, or not pay attention in the classroom. They, they functionally give up, which, which is why that being able to read by third or fourth grade is, is so very, very important because the, well, the lower your, your literacy is a, as an individual, the higher likelihood you are to, to end up in jail for, for one reason or another. Um, violence, yes, it, violence has always been an issue in some schools, but in a lot of the places we get involved in, they, they're not used to it. It is not a common occurrence, and yet it seems to be happening more and more often, and in all likelihood, a bunch of the administrators are letting these students get off with a slap on the wrist. And I think it's very clear that a lot of the disciplinary practices in these school districts are not working, and we need to take another look at it. Uh, we have a viewer off of text saying, uh, it seems though that your agency doesn't want schools to teach about social system issues that have and some that still do exist in this country. Where should students learn about the issues? If not at school, what if students aren't taught about such things at home? Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused on, on social system. I'm, I'm just going to assume for the sake of the argument that they mean things like systemic injustices. Um, I guess to, to use a, a common, uh, more, more liberal talking point, they can go learn about it in college, right, if they were really want to. Uh, th this isn't something that they need in, in K-12 through education. We don't, we don't need to teach kindergartners about ethnic studies and systemic injustices in this country uh, like what Minnesota does under Governor Walls. Uh, they can go, if they really want to, learn about critical theory in a more advanced program in college, or they can go buy a book uh, because the books are not banned, and there are plenty of them that talk about it. Uh, Governor Landry in Louisiana just signed an executive order about giving schools not to teach so-called critical race theory. What do you think about the move? And is it, is it defined as such? I mean, will you find courses labeled as such in, in schools? So the, the, the concept of critical race theory is interesting, especially, for example, if, if I was debating somebody to the right of me, they would say critical race theory is not taught in K-12 education. In Literally, this might be the case. There may not be a course titled critical race theory, what it is that they teach to, to a sixth grader. However, uh, again, they teach it in colleges. This is widely acknowledged, and most of our teachers come from teachers' colleges. The critical theory is a pedagogical structure that they use to inform education for students. So they may not say, we're gonna learn about critical race theory today, but they might say, we're gonna learn about systemic injustices in America today. We're gonna learn about uh, white supremacy today, or we're gonna learn about why black students are oppressed by the current American system. This has popped up in individual models. It may not be explicit curriculum, but a lot of teachers take it upon themselves to insert it in their lessons. Not all teachers, but some of them do, and it, this is why it's up to school boards to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, we'll hear next from Tim. 
Tim in Maryland, Republican line. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Good morning. This is a great topic. Um, I, I just have a comment. So um, we, we, we celebrate American history. We celebrate our independence with pomp and pageantry. Um, I, I think personally that, uh, you know, not only should we celebrate and recognize the joyful and good parts of American history, uh, we must also uh, be comfortable enough or get to the point where we can discuss the darker parts of American history. We can't have one without the other. other otherwise, we do ourselves a disservice in teaching our children about the founding of the country, its history, um, the direction it can go, how things can be better. Um, it, it's, in my opinion, it's not necessarily about making anybody feel bad. It's about having people cognizant of the realities and the struggle and, um, you know, the, the, the mechanism that have gotten America to where it is today. Um, that's my comment. Thank okay. You. Tim in Maryland. Thanks. The, the, this isn't about not teaching the darker parts of America's history or, or where we may have gone wrong in the past or, or made bad decisions as a country. This isn't about avoiding that. Uh, we're, we're still going to teach slavery. What we're not going to teach in this country is we are not going to teach black students that they're oppressed just because they're black. And we're not going to teach white students that they're ahead of everybody else and that they're responsible for everybody else being behind whether or not they took an active role in something that happened before their parents and their grandparents were born. This isn't about, uh, it, it, like what you said, this is not about putting people down or making people feel bad. But the way that these programs are structured is to blame something inherent to your identity, race, on ills that continue to this day. This is not about avoiding a specific issue. This is about not giving people guilt for something that they had no involvement in. Uh, we have a viewer, uh, this is MLB off of X, saying certain states like Massachusetts and Connecticut are always in the top five in education. Why aren't you focusing on their education systems as a model for all 50 states? They have proven track records of success. Well, I, I will say that everybody's test scores are slipping and, and there are still systemic issues in the education system that need work, like uh, students or teachers not teaching students how to read correctly. I would have to, have to double check specifically what, what Massachusetts and Connecticut are doing, but I would be willing to bet that they have put a higher emphasis on phonics and the science of reading than some other states. And the ones that are doing that are catching up. And, and as far as Connecticut, Connecticut goes, I, I will say that they also have taken a lead on an issue that is now becoming bipartisan, which is restricting cell phone use in schools. Uh, the governor of Connecticut has done it, the governor of Virginia has done it, the governor of Utah has done it, and, and more and more states are picking up the slack there as well. Why do you think that is? I think it's because 70% of teachers agree that cell phone usage is a distraction. Students are not paying attention. It, it, they're addicted to their phones, to social media apps that are designed to capture their attention all day, every day. And what we want is students to sit down and learn, to engage with the teacher, to engage with the content, and it's not up to the teachers to try and outmaneuver a phone. It is up to the school districts and, and the legislatures to make sure that, that students have all the incentives they need, including negative incentives, to make sure they pay attention. One more call. This will be from Maryland, Independent Line. This is Gregory. Good morning. I'd like to talk, ask this gentleman, uh, make a, a comment first and then ask a question. I said, uh, the question is, the comment is, this guy is just giving a smoke screen for white people feeling bad. That's not the intent. His intent is not concerned about the scores and re the reading ability of, of these students. He's a smoke screen. He's just a smoke screen for trying to make white people not feel bad about history. How in the world does, my question is, how in the world does the, the history of the United States uh, have anything to do with a student not being able to read? Okay, Gregory in Maryland. Well, you're exactly right. Teaching students how to read has nothing to do with the specific history of the United States. That's why we are focused on teaching students how to read 
and not engaging in, in issues over white privilege or white guilt that a lot of our, our more, more liberal detractors seem to push very heavily in the curriculum. So you're exactly right. Uh, 1776projectpack.com is the website for our guest. He serves as the coalition's and candidate recruitment director, Adam Zetti. Thanks for giving us your time. Thank you for having me on. We're going to have